Hey guys, welcome to the Docker course. In this course, we will be discussing what is Docker and how we can use it in our development workflow. Also, we will be looking into how Docker replaces the VMs with containers and what advantages it provides over VMs. Once we have a good understanding of Docker, we will be installing Docker for the hands on. Once Docker is installed, we will go through the Docker commands we use and different types of Docker networks by running MongoDB with Docker. After that, we will be building a custom Docker image for the Spring Boot application. Also, we will be building custom Docker image for React.js application by following the best practices like multi-stage builds, Docker caching, Docker ignore, etc. After that, we will see how to persist the container data even after the container is deleted using Docker volumes. Once we have our custom images ready, we will be pushing Docker images to private registry like AWS ECR. Finally, we will see how to run multiple containers with Docker Compose. We will be discussing all these concepts with complete hands on by running UI, API, and database in Docker and enable communication between those. I have used animations wherever needed for better understanding. If you watch this course completely, I guarantee you that you can work with the Docker confidently on your own. You can take this course the way you would like to. Generally, I take running notes while learning any subject by writing important points in a book or notepad on my system. And I write those points in the form of keywords and diagrams that I can understand so that I can refer to that notes for a quick recap in the future. Well, without any further delay, let's get started. Docker is a tool designed to create, deploy and run applications easily by using containers. Don't worry if this sounded too complex. By end of this video, I promise you that the concept of the docker will be clear to you. Today we will be discussing problem statement that docker is trying to solve, how docker solves these problems, docker overview and then docker architecture. Before learning any new technology, first we need to understand the problems we have with the existing approaches and how this new technology solves these problems. With that said, let's start with problem statement 1. Let's say we have dev and QA environments. Initially, the developer starts developing the application by installing the required dependencies. Once the application is developed, it gets shipped to the QA environment. To make the application work, we need to install the dependencies required in the QA environment as well. Of course, this is a tedious and time consuming job as you need to install the dependencies in all environments. Let's say this is a Java application and the developer is using Java 8 in his local host and the same has to be installed in the QA environment. Once the application setup is done, the application works great in QA environment. After some days, the developer upgrades the Java version to Java 10 and starts working on a new feature. Once he feels the application is working in his local, he ships the application to the QA environment. But this time, the application will not work as expected as Java is not upgraded in QA environment and QA engineer reports an issue. This is where the most popular debate comes into the picture where developer says, hey, I'm not able to replicate this issue. This is working on my mission. So close this bug. And QA engineer says, I don't care if it is working fine on your mission. We are not going to deliver your mission to the client. So with this problem statement, we can conclude the following issues with the traditional deployment approach. It's time consuming process as you need to make sure all the dependencies are installed. This leads to compatibility issues if we miss any version updates. Also it's error prone as there are a lot of chances application may break. So what's the solution to this problem? What if there's a way to ship the dependencies along with the application? Is that possible? Yes, that's where Docker comes into the picture. Docker packages the application and the dependencies required to run the application into a single bundle and ship it to the target environment. In Docker world, we call this bundle as image. 
Now, when we run this image in QA environment, this creates an isolated environment for the application to run by installing all the required packages. And we call this isolated environment a container. This time, the application works fine without any issues as there are no version mismatches. No matter where you run this image, it behaves exactly the same way. Now let's take a look at the problem statement too. Let's say we have three different applications running on the same host. And now we want to isolate these three applications due to security reasons. The immediate solution that we get in our mind is deploying these three applications on three different hosts. This works. But this is not a cost efficient solution and increases the maintenance overhead. The second thought that we get is what if we install three different VMs on a single host? This solution also works, but this is also not an effective solution as VMs take a lot of resources from the host. So, how can we solve this problem? Again, this is where Docker comes into the picture. With Docker, we can package these three applications into three different images and run them on a single host. Now, three different containers are created on the same host and are isolated. So now you may think that that's what we are doing with the VMs too, right? Yes, but there are several advantages of using containers over VMs, which are containers are lightweight and smaller in size, whereas VMs take a lot of space. Containers use very few system resources like CPU, RAM, etc. compared to VMs. Don't worry, we will be discussing the differences between VMs and containers in detail in the next video of the series. Now, as we understand what problems Docker is trying to solve, let's try to look at the definition of Docker once again. Docker is a tool designed to create, deploy, and run applications easily by using containers. Did it sound simple now? I hope so. By taking advantage of Docker's methodologies for shipping, testing, and deploying code quickly, you can significantly reduce the delay between writing code and running it in production. Image is a bundle that contains the application along with all the dependencies required. When we run this image that creates container, which is an isolated environment where our application runs. You can compare the images and containers to classes and objects if you are familiar with the object-oriented concepts. A class is a blueprint that holds the information to create an object. And you can create number of similar objects with the same class. In the same way, images contain the instructions to create a Docker container. We can create number of containers with the same image. Docker images are shareable through the container registers like Docker Hub, AWS ECR, which will be discussed in later videos. Now let us understand the architecture of the Docker engine. Docker engine is a client server application and used to build and containerize applications. This is where we run the Docker images to create containers. It includes Docker server, which is a type of long running program called daemon process and used to create and manage docker objects like images, containers, networks and volumes. Docker server pulls and pushes the images from the docker registry. Docker registry is a place where we store images just like we store the code in the github repository. There are also private repositories like AWS ECR, Azure registry. It also has Docker client with which the user can interact with the Docker. It includes a REST API that specifies the interface that program can use to talk to the daemon and instruct it on what to do. Docker listens for the Docker API request continuously and manages the Docker resources based on the request. A CLI command line interface which uses the Docker REST API internally to control or interact with the docker daemon through the scripting or other direct CLI commands. So to summarize, image is a lightweight standalone executable package of software that includes everything needed to run an application. It consists the code, 
runtime, system tools, system libraries, and settings. Images become containers when they run on Docker engine. Here are some advantages of using Docker. Portability. Once the working application is containerized, it can be deployed to any system and applications perform exactly the same way as it did when they are packaged. Performance. As containers have smaller footprints compared to VMs, applications perform a lot better. Isolation. As containers are isolated, there will not be any version conflicts with other applications. Scalability. Container can be created quickly if application demands. Rapid development. Docker makes the development and deployment easier with the help of images and containers. I hope now you understand the fundamentals of Docker and how it simplifies the development and deployment. Let us see how we deploy an application traditionally on a bare metal server. We will have our hardware. It consists of CPU, RAM, etc. On top of this, we will have our OS installed, which can be Windows, Linux, or Mac. To understand what a container is, first we need to understand the architecture of OS. There are two major parts in an OS, kernel and application layer. Kernel controls the access to the resources and schedules processes. That means, whenever we perform an operation, a process will be created and allocated some resources to that process like CPU, memory, etc. And in application layer, our applications get deployed, which typically contains a source code and required dependencies to run the application. And applications talk to kernel to schedule processes. Let's say we want to run two Java applications. One uses Java 8 and the other uses Java 10. But we have Java 8 installed in our system. So obviously the application which uses Java 10 will not work. When we have multiple applications like this, it becomes difficult to manage dependencies and applications. To avoid this issue, we need to isolate the application such that each application runs in its own environment with its dependencies. This can be achieved with the concept of namespace in OS. A namespace is a feature of Linux kernel that partitions the kernel resources such that one process sees one set of resources while another process sees a different set of resources. This partition is called a container. In the same way, we can create multiple containers with their own set of resources on a single host. Now, both Java 8 and Java 10 applications work. So, with the namespace, we can easily maintain different applications with its own set of resources. You might be thinking that's what we are doing with the VMs too, right? Not exactly. Now let us see the architectural differences between a VM and a container. In VM architecture, we will have our hardware. On top of this, we'll have our OS installed. On top of hosted OS, we will have hypervisor. This hypervisor is responsible to create and maintain VMs. This is the reason a hypervisor is also called a VM monitor. Of course. A hypervisor can be installed directly on hardware that is mainly used in data centers like AWS. The hypervisor which runs on hardware is called type 1 hypervisor, example Microsoft Hyper-V. And hypervisor which runs on OS is called type 2 hypervisor, example VirtualBox. For now, let's assume we have type 2 hypervisor which runs on OS. Each VM contains a guest OS that is specific to VM. This OS can be anything irrespective of the host OS, meaning Windows VM can be installed on the Linux machine and Linux VM can be installed on the Windows machine. This is the reason VMs can be run on any machine. Along with this OS, we will have our libraries like Java dependencies, node modules and our actual application which is typically source code installed in this VM. AWS EC2 is a typical example of VM. But the guest OS is generally huge and our application doesn't use all of the features of OS. So we are wasting resources unnecessarily. Also, this increases the cost as we need to get the OS license. These are the problems what exactly container solves. Container eliminates the need of guest OS. If we look at the container architecture, 
we will have our hardware and OS similar to the VM architecture. In place of hypervisor, we will have our container runtime. We have many container runtimes in the market like Docker, Racket, etc. This container runtime is responsible to create and manage the containers as we discussed in our Docker engine architecture. In a container, we will have libraries and apps running in an isolated environment. Here, we don't have a dedicated OS for containers and all containers share the same OS. This is the reason containers cannot run on a different OS. Example, an image built on Windows cannot run on Linux. As we don't have a guest OS, containers are lightweight and start very fast compared to VM. In our day-to-day -day life, we use containers without knowing. VL apps feature in Android mobiles are using Linux container technology. So, to summarize, Containers and VMs aim at the same purpose, that is, deploying multiple and isolated services on a single platform. VM virtualizes the hardware and the container virtualizes the OS. VMs have their guest OS, whereas containers share the same host OS. VMs are of gigabyte size, whereas containers of megabyte size. VM creation takes too long, a container can be created in seconds. VMs take time to boot up and containers can be started in seconds. VMs consume lot of resources, containers consume very few resources. I hope now you understand what a container is and how it differs from a VM. Now it's time for some hands-on. For the same, we need to install Docker in our machine. Let us see if you have docker installed already in our system. To check if it's already installed, just open up your terminal and type docker it enter. If you see the error, it states that command not found docker. That means docker is not installed in your system. If you see the list of command docker supports, that means the docker is already installed in your system. If it's already installed in your system, you don't need to follow any of the steps and you're all set. Just sit back and enjoy watching the video to know what are the steps involved in installing the Docker. As it's not installed in my system, I'm going to install it by downloading the Docker. To download Docker, just open up any of your favorite browser and go to docker.com and click on get started. Please notice Docker Desktop here. If you are on Windows or Mac, you need to download Docker for Desktop. For Linux, you don't need Docker Desktop and can be installed with a couple of commands directly. And those commands are pretty straightforward. I'll give those commands in the description box and you can just run those as it is. Well, I'm on Mac with Intel chip, so I'm downloading this one. If you are on Windows, download for Windows. As I'm on Mac, I downloaded Docker desktop for Mac. Let's give it some time to download as it's a little big file. Okay, as you can see, it's downloaded. And I'm going to open this .dmg file. If you are on Windows, you will get the .exe file and open it once it's downloaded. As I said, it's similar to installing any other application in Windows. Just click next, next, agree and install. That's the reason I'm not making a video for that. But if you think I should make a video on that, please feel free to comment. Definitely I'll make a video on Windows and Linux installation. Drag and drop this whale icon onto applications. Now we should start the Docker. To start the Docker, just search for Docker and run it. Just click on open and give the permissions it's needed. Please enter your system password. If you see, the Docker engine is starting. That's it. The Docker is started now. To verify the Docker is installed properly or not from the terminal, just open up your terminal or command prompt and type Docker and hit enter. Awesome. You see the list of commands it supports? That means Docker is installed in a mission. Congratulations. 
As a final step, let us check what version of Docker we have with us. If you see the supported commands the Docker here, you see a command called version. Just type Docker version. And you can see the Docker version here. It's that simple. Now you are all set to start working on Docker. I hope you followed along with me and have Docker up and running in your mission. I am very much excited to do some hands on with you in my next video. Stay tuned. I hope Docker is up and running in your system and you are ready to follow along with me. This video should cover most of the basic commands that we use in Docker. Before we start with our first command, we will try to understand what is Docker registry. If you remember, we discussed Docker registry in the Docker architecture discussion. Docker registry is a place where we push our images with different versions from our mission. We can also pull different images from Docker registry to our mission. You can compare it pushing and pulling your source code from and to GitHub respectively. We can access Docker registry at hub.docker.com and click on explore to see what are the images available. These are the images pushed by different companies and individuals so that others can use those images. For example, if you want to install Nginx, traditionally you will download Nginx from the internet and you will install it in your system. But with Docker, all you need to do is just search for Nginx image and run a simple command. That's it. You will be having Nginx with you. If you see here, 1 billion plus people downloaded this image. Let's see that in action. If you see the command here, docker pull nginx. This is the command which we use to download the image. Just copy this command and paste it in your terminal. And hit enter. If you can see, it is pulling images from docker registry. If you see the message it printed, it is downloading the latest version of Nginx. If you want to pull any specific version of Nginx, just type docker pull nginx colon version number. You can see the different versions supported by image in the description of the image in the docker registry. These are all the versions supported by this image. Let's try to install 1.20 version. If you see 1.20 version is pulling from the docker registry. Now we have two different versions of nginx. Let's verify whether we have those images available with us by running a simple command. The command is docker images. If you see we have two nginx images with different tags latest and 1.20. Please note that these are just images we didn't create any container yet. As we discussed in the introduction to docker video, when we run an image that creates a container, the container is the place where our service actually runs. Image is just a blueprint to create the container. Now let us create the container from this nginx image. To create the container out of image, just run docker run and name of your image. Here, the name of our image is nginx. This is where our actual service will be running. Now we have nginx container. To see the list of containers we have, let's run docker ps in another tab. This command will list all the containers we have. If you see here, just now we created a nginx container. So this is the image name from which the container has been created. This is the container ID. Okay, let's come out of the container which is running here by pressing Ctrl C. Now we came out of the container and try to run docker ps. If you see here, we don't have any containers running here. To list out all the containers which are running and stopped, just run docker ps a. If you see here, this is the container which is exited 34 seconds ago, which is the one we stopped with Ctrl C. But 
How do I solve the problem of staying in the terminal? We can run the container in the background with hyphen D flag. Just run docker run hyphen D nginx. If you run docker ps, you can see the container which is running. The beauty of docker is you can run any number of nginx instances with same command. Let's try to run docker run nginx 1.20 and let's try to run this in the detached mode. If you see the container created. Now we should have two containers running. One is the latest version which we ran previously and another one is 1.20 version of nginx which we just ran. Docker PS. If you can see we have the two different versions of nginx. One is latest another one is 1.2 well our containers are now running with nginx service but how do i access those nginx runs by default on port 80 so generally we should be able to access nginx on localhost 80 or just localhost as browser serves 80 port by default but if you can see we cannot access nginx service what does it mean is nginx service is not running no it's actually running let's see why we are not able to access it let's say we have two containers running in our host or laptop each container gets its unique ip address when it's created just like we have an ip for a host but this ip can be accessed only from your host where the container is actually running every service in a container runs on a port. In this case, our Nginx is running on port 80. To make it available on host IP, we need to map container port to the host port. Now to access the first Nginx service, we should map the port 80 of Nginx to 80 port of the host. Not only 80 port, you can use any port which is not being used by any other service. To do that, run docker run p which means that we are mapping the ports. We are mapping 80 port of the host to the 80 port of the container and we are running nginx image. As we are not specifying any version here, the latest version will be used. And let's run this one in the detached mode and hit enter. If you see the container now created. Let us see what we are doing here. We are saying that any request comes on 80 port of host IP, just forward it to the port 80 of the container. Now let us try to access our Nginx. Great, here is your Nginx. With just a single command, you are able to get your Nginx. Not only Nginx, you can get anything which is hosted in Docker Hub, be it Postgres, MySQL, Redis, etc. Now we are able to access our first Nginx service. If you remember, we also created another version of Nginx which is 1.20. Let us try to access that one as well on a different port. To access our second Nginx service, just run same command docker run hyphen p 80 port of the host to the 80 port of the container hyphen d Nginx and we want to run 1.20 version. Let's hit enter. If you see the error, the port is already allocated. Both Nginx services can run on the same port of the container, but we cannot map those two containers to the same port of the host. Host port is always unique. So, as 80 port is already being used with the first Nginx container, let us try to map it to the different port of the host. To do that, just change the port of the host 80 to 90. If you see, the container is created. Let us try to access the second Nginx service as well. Let's open a new tab and go to localhost colon 90. If you see, we have two Nginx services are running. The both Nginx services runs. Now let us try to run docker ps to see what are the running containers. If you see we have the four containers running. These are the two containers 
we ran previously without giving any port mapping and these are the containers we just created with the port mapping if you can see here the ports are mapped here we are saying that port 90 of the host is mapped to the port 80 of the container same goes here port 80 of the host mapped to the port 80 of the container so now we have four containers as we are able to access these containers and we are not able to access these containers let's try to delete it just to save some space to delete a container just run docker rm and your container id here is the container id so just paste here you can delete multiple containers by giving container ids separated by space if you see the error here stop the container before attempting to removal or force remove it means that you cannot remove a container without stopping the container so before that let's try to stop the container to stop the container just change this rm to stop if you see the containers are stopped now we can verify with that with the docker ps if you can see those containers are not anymore here as i mentioned earlier docker ps gives the containers only which are running if you want to see the all the containers just run docker ps hyphen a so these are the containers which we stopped so let's try to remove those containers now. If you see these two containers are removed and you can verify it with docker ps a Now those containers are not anymore here. We can also delete these containers which are not running with docker rm container id space another one and you can remove it. You can verify with docker ps a it's difficult to remember these container ids so whenever any container is created it gets a random name if you want to give a custom name to your container let's run docker run hyphen hyphen name test and your image name and let's run it in detached mode if you see the container is created now let us list the containers if you can see here which is test and please note that whenever we execute docker run it will create a new container to change the name of the existing container just run docker rename and your name of the container with the new name test1 and let us list the containers if you see here the name is changed let us see how to restart a container to do that let's try to stop this container docker stop container id if you don't want to remember this container id you can give the container name also if you see the container is stopped we can verify that with the docker ps hyphen a if you see this container is exited nine seconds ago let's try to restart the container for that just run docker start container name if you see the container is started we can verify that with docker ps here we go you can see the container status as up well now we know how to delete a container how to start a container and how to stop the container now let us see how to delete a image to do that let's list out the images we have if you see we have nginx image with two different versions if you see each image size is 133 mb to free up some space in a machine let's try to delete this nginx 1.20 version to do that docker rmi nginx colon 1.20 i am deleting the 1.20 version of nginx image if you see the error message it's saying that this container is already using that image to delete an image we must remove the containers dependent on that image to do that docker stop container id let's remove the container also docker rm container id now we can delete the image with the same command if you see the image is deleted we can verify that with the docker images if you see 
we have only one image which is of latest version. At any point of time, if you are not sure what flags are available for a specific command, just docker hyphen help. Let's see what are the flags available on the run command. If you see, these are all the flags available on the run command. If you see, we already used hyphen p command for the port mapping. In this way, you can get the help on any commands with just hyphen hyphen help command. Now you might be getting a question. Well. I developed my react.js or Spring Boot application and I can't get this image in the docker registry. How do I build a custom image for my application? Don't worry, we will build custom images for our Spring Boot and react.js applications from scratch. Stay tuned. I hope you followed along with me and got more familiar with the docker. In this video, we will try to understand what are the different types of docker networks available and how to run applications in these networks. For demonstration, we will be deploying MongoDB and Mongo Express and see how to establish connection between these two. Let's try to run MongoDB first. For that, we will pull the image from Docker Hub. Let's choose a specific version instead of using the latest version. Let's try to use 4.4.6. Let's go to terminal, pull the image with Docker, pull mongo 4.4.6 well we have mongodb image with us now let's try to run this image to create the mongodb container for that docker run mongo 4.4.6 instead of running this image directly let's see how we can configure this image to check how we can configure this image let's head back to the description section of this mongodb image if you can see here, we can set the environment variables. Mongo init root is a name and Mongo init root password. Basically, this creates a super user who can have all the privileges. Let's try to set up the user. To set up the user, we should pass these two variables as the environment variables. To pass environment variables to an image, we should use iPhone E flag. Let's give the username as root and let's also give the Password as password and let's publish the ports. By default, Mongo runs on 27,017 port and let's map it to the 27,017 port of the host and let's run it in the p test mode. Now we should have the MongoDB container up and running. If you see, this is created four seconds ago and the status is up. Let's try to test this one from MongoDB Compass. MongoDB Compass is just a desktop tool I downloaded from the internet and installed just to test my Mongo database. You can use any tool of your choice like Robo3D, etc. Let's fill in the connection fix. So we are running on the local host 2717 port and the username is root and the password is password. Let's connect it. Great, we are able to connect to the Mongo database. Now let's try to run Mongo Express. Mongo Express is a web-based application to connect to Mongo database. Previously we tested from MongoDB Compass that is a desktop tool and this is a web-based application. Let's try to run this image. Let's go back to terminal. Docker run Mongo Express. And we should give details like to which database it should connect to iPhone E and same thing you can find out the configuration information from the docker hub page let's head back to docker hub and find out the environment variables if you can see these are all the environment variables that we can configure on this image these four are the important ones the first one is the username the second one is the password and third one is the port if you don't specify the port automatically it takes 27017 and mongodb server is the host of your mongodb that you want to connect to. let's set up this Our username was root and password was password. Let's set up the server also. Local host. Let's keep the icon EE as well. And let's publish the ports. Mongo Express by default runs on 8081 and we are mapping it to the 8081 port of the host and let's run into the detached mode and let's give it some name let's run this 
wondered why I didn't pull the image first before running. If you see here, unable to find the image Mongo Express locally and it's pulling from the Docker Hub. When you do Docker run, it automatically pulls the image if it doesn't exist in your system and runs it. So in short, Docker run is equal to Docker pull plus Docker run. Well, let's try to access Mongo Express on localhost 8081. Boom, it's not working. Let us understand the root cause by checking the logs. Whenever a container is not working, you can check the logs with docker logs container id. Here, the container id is this one. If you see here, it is not able to connect to the localhost 27070. Let's see what's happening here. At the moment, we have two containers on our Docker host. One is MongoDB and the other one is Mongo Express. We also have Mongo Compass, which is a desktop application. Note that it's not containerized, meaning we didn't run this with Docker. We tried to access MongoDB with the local host using Compass and it worked. But the same thing with Express is not working. Here, we are trying to access MongoDB container from the Mongo Express container. When you say localhost from the container, it's not same as localhost from your host. The container doesn't have any idea of what's going on outside unless we explicitly mention it. As we discussed earlier, when a container is created, it gets a unique IP address. So instead of giving localhost, let's give IP address of the container and see what happens and see what containers we have awesome we have mongodb which is running and mongo express which is failed let's try to get the ip address of this mongo container to get the ip address of any container we need to run docker inspect container id so this is the container information here at the end you can see the ip address if you want to print only IP address, you can do grep IP address. You can see the IP address here. So let's try to give this IP address instead of localhost when we run the Mongo Express. Let's try to delete the Mongo Express which is failing. Docker RM container ID. Okay. Now let's run the Mongo Express with the IP address of the MongoDB container. If you hit the up arrow, you will get the recent commands. And you can give the IP address here. Now let's try to access Mongo Express. Great, it's working. But giving an IP address always is not a great idea because if the IP address gets changed for any reason, the Mongo Express doesn't work. What if there is a way to refer the MongoDB with the name of the container instead of IP address? That can be achieved with Docker networks. If you want to see what are the different Docker networks available on your host, you can simply type Docker Network LS. You can see the three different networks available here. These are the three default networks created when you install your Docker. The three networks are Bridge, Host, and None. Let's start with None Network. If you have a container in this none network, you will not be able to access anything outside this container except the resources of that container. Let's see that in action by running an alpine image in this none network. If you don't know what is alpine, alpine is Linux lightweight distribution which is of just 5 MB. Let's try to run alpine image docker run alpine and let's run it in detached mode. And let's run this one in none network. To give the network, you need to give iPhone iPhone network none. So now this Alpine image will run in the none network. Let's try to run this. If you see the image is getting downloaded from the Docker Hub. Let's try to see the containers available. If you see this is the Alpine image we ran and this is exited immediately. The reason why it didn't run is Alpine is operating system. The purpose of container is not to host any operating system. The purpose of container is to run some service or to run some computation in the container. When there is no service in the container, 
immediately it gets exited. Here we are just running Alpine image which is just operating system. There is no other service is running. That's the reason if you have seen previously, Mongo Express immediately exited when it couldn't able to connect to the Mongo database. So when there is no service running in the container, it immediately exists. The only purpose of container is to run some service in the container. So let's fix this problem by running some command in this OS. I am just running a command of sleep for 500 seconds. So now some process will be going on in the OS which is sleeping. So let's run this image now. If you try to see the containers now, I'm sorry. You can see it is up. Just like you are getting into your computer by logging in, you can get into the container and you can actually see what's going on inside your container. To get into any container, docker exec and your container ID. And you need to give ISON IT and at the end you need to give sh. Don't worry about this command. We will be discussing about this command in detail in our next videos. For now, just assume that docker exec command is just to get into the container. Let's run this. If you see, we are in the container. Now you can list down the folders available in this container. Now let's try to ping google.com. If you see, it's not able to identify google.com. That's the reason when you run any container in the NUN network, it cannot access anything outside the container. Forget about the google.com. It cannot even access the MongoDB container which is running in the same Docker host. Network not reachable. So when you run any container in the NUN network, it cannot access anything outside that container. It's as simple as that. To come out of this container, you just type exit. Now we are in the Docker host. Now if you ping google.com you get some response because you're not in the NUN network now you're on the docker host but this network doesn't suit in most of the situation as we will be consuming different resources like APIs or MongoDB in our case that's where bridge network comes into the picture bridge networks can access external resources and containers in the same network let us try to run the same Alpine image in the bridge network. For that, docker run Alpine in detached mode to make some service running 500. And let's run this in bridge network. Please note that even if we don't specify the network, by default it gets added to the bridge network. Now, we should have Alpen image running. This is the one it created. Let's get into the container. IT container ID SH. Now we are in the container. Now let's try to ping google.com. If you see, we are able to receive the data from Google. So when a container is in the bridge network, it can access the external resources. Let's come out of the container. Now in the default bridge network, we have Alpine container running and we have MongoDB container running and also Mongo Express container is running. As we didn't give any network while creating this MongoDB and Mongo Express container, by default they get added to the default bridge network. Now these three containers can communicate with each other. That's the reason we could able to access the MongoDB container from the Mongo Express container using the IP address of the MongoDB container. But our goal was to access the container with the name of the container instead of using IP address. This is not possible using the default bridge network. To access the container with the container name, we should create the custom bridge network. This is one of the differences between the default bridge network and the custom bridge network. Default bridge network forbids accessing the other container using the container name. To access any container within the same network, we need to create the custom bridge network. To create the custom bridge network, docker network create network name. 
and we should mention this is of type bridge even if you don't mention by default it considers as bridge network please note that you cannot create a custom none network or custom host network you can only create custom bridge network there are other different networks also available like overlay maclan now we should able to see our custom network in the network list if you see here this is our custom bridge network now let us try to run this mongodb in this custom bridge network before that let's try to stop and remove the existing containers just to demonstrate how to delete all containers at once to stop all the containers at once all you need to do is docker stop dollar docker ps hyphen a so this will stop all the containers and also you can delete all the containers with docker rm now if you list containers you will not see any containers now let's try to run the mongodb in this custom bridge network we use this command initially to run the mongodb container let's try to run the same thing but in custom bridge network to connect to a network all you need to do is fn fn network or just net mongo net and let's give it some name so that we can refer to it in future fn fn name mongo db let's enter now the container is created let's try to run the mongo express now let's create this container also in the same custom bridge network fn fn net mongo net and instead of giving it ip address of the container let's try to give the name of the mongodb container if you remember this was the name we given while creating the mongodb container now we are referring to this mongodb from mongo express with just name of the container let's hit enter let's try to access mongo express localhost 8081 here we go we are able to run mongo express by connecting to the mongodb with just container name and the third network we have is host network when you create a container in the host network you can access anything from this container as a practice you can create alpine container in host network and try to access different containers and external resources like google.com and verify whether you are able to access everything from this container i hope now you have enough understanding on docker networks and how to communicate with other containers i hope you followed along with me and mongodb is up and running in your system we will be using this mongo database in our next videos stay tuned so far we have seen what is docker hub and how to pull an image from docker hub and create containers by running those images also we have seen how to configure these images according to our needs and how containers can communicate with each other but what if you want to build your own image for your application in this video for demonstration we will be building a custom image for our spring boot application and try to dockerize this application by covering the most useful commands that we use in docker file to build an image we would write docker file docker file is a text document with a list of instructions to build an image and we will run docker build command to build an image out of this docker file then you can push that image to docker hub if you want to share it with the community or you want to pull it in a different environment you can also create the container with the local image that you built but what is a docker file as we discussed it's a text document with a list of instructions to build an image all these instructions will be in the form of instruction followed by arguments for example if you want to copy something from your local to the image all you will do is copy space source space destination this will copy app.jar which is in the target folder of the host to the root directory of the image the instruction is not case sensitive meaning capital copy and small copy both are same however the convention is for them to be upper case to distinguish them from arguments more easily you can also add comments for better readability with hash to better understand how we can write this docker file let's try to write docker file for a spring boot application this is simple to do application developed with spring boot pretty simple with just few crud operations 
in this application, we have a couple of APIs create a to do item and get all to do items. No authentication and all for simplicity. This will connect to the Mongo database that we deployed using Docker in the previous video of this series. No matter how complex your application is, the way we build images will be almost the same. I have added the Git repository link of this project in the description of this video if you want to go through it. Let us see how we can run this Spring Boot application without Docker so that we can mimic the same steps with Docker. Traditionally, once we finish developing the application, we will run mvn clean package. This will generate the jar file in the target directory. We can verify that here. In the target directory, we have to do f1 1.0.0.jar. So, this is the jar file which we run to start the application. To start the application, all we'll do is java jar target slash to do iPhone. 1.0.0.jar if you see the application is started and we can test those apis from the postman if you don't know what postman is postman is a desktop tool with which you can test your apis this is the mongo express we ran in the previous video of this series and we don't have any to do database here let's try to create a to do item it is created let's verify that in our mongo database Let's refresh this and a to do database is created and there's a collection called to do's in that we have our to do item. We can also get the to do items with the get API. The to do item. Let us try to run the same Spring Boot application with Docker. Generally, the packaging part which we have done with the MVN clean package outside of the Docker, like in Jenkins or any other CA tool. But you can do the packaging part also in Docker. For simplicity, we will package outside of the Docker. Already we have generated the jar file. As an initial step in building an image, we should create Docker file. Docker file. No extension. Please note that it's not mandatory that the file name must be Docker file only. It can be anything. The only thing the Docker daemon cares about is the instructions in the Docker file are valid. The validation is performed before starting the actual building process. Well, here are the steps we will do in Dockerfile to run this application. Download Java because we are going to run this application in an isolated environment, which is the container, and it does not use the local Java, fully isolated. Next, we will copy the jar file from local to image next run application with java jar that's it if we can convert these steps to docker file instructions we are good let us start by writing docker file with the above steps every image that you find in docker hub as a docker file this is the docker file of the alpine image that we worked with recently let us try to write docker file like this for a spring boot application as a first step, we need to download the Java in the container. To run the Spring Boot application, we need Java, right? So the first thing we should mention to Dockerfile is, please pull the Java image because we need to run the Java application. This can be done with from image name. We need Java image. Let us try to find Java image in Docker Hub. Java. If you see, this is the official image of Java. So we will be using OpenJDK and we will use 18-JDK. So OpenJDK colon and the version is 18-JDK. If you are using any code editor, you can see the version suggestions here. You can use any Java version that you would need. A Docker file must begin with a from instruction. However, you can write comments. Also, you can declare some global variables. We will see how we declare a variable in some time. These comment lines are removed before the Dockerfile instructions are executed. The from instruction sets the base image for subsequent instructions. Next, we will copy the jar file from local to image. To copy a file, we use copy instruction with source and destination. Our source is target slash to do iPhone 1.0.0.jar. And we will copy this to the root directory of the image to do 
iPhone 1.0.0.jap. Instead of copy, you can use add also. Both copy and add instructions serve similar purposes. They let you copy files from a specific location into the Docker image. Add does a little more compared to copy. Add also lets you use a URL instead of a local file or directory so that it gets downloaded into the image from the URL. Also, you can extract a tar file from the source directly into the destination. A valid use case for add is when you want to extract a local tar file into a specific directory in your Docker image. This is exactly what Alpine image does with add. It is extracting the tar file into the root directory with add instruction. Now we should start the service. As we discussed in the previous video, the only purpose of a container is to run some service or process. If you don't run anything, it will exit immediately. If you look at the docker file of Alpine, we are not running any process here. SH is not a process like web server. SH waits for the inputs from the terminal. So that's the reason Alpine image gets exited if you run it. To make it run, we were passing the sleep command from the terminal. That's where the entry point helps. Entry point helps to run something. In our case, we need to run a jar file. So it can be done with entry point java iphone jar and to do iphone 1.0.0. jar. Instead of entry point, CMD instruction can also be used. The main difference between the two is commands passed to entry point will be appended to the existing command, whereas commands passed to the CMD will replace entire command. As we are not passing any commands to this, let's use entry point. Also, let's change this one to copy because this is more relevant as we are just copying the file from one location to another location. So, entry point or CMD instruction allows you to configure a container that will run as an executable. Well, we covered all the steps to build an image for our Spring Boot application. Note that we just written instructions. We didn't run this set to build an image. Now we should build the image from this Docker file. To build an image from Docker file, we should run docker build iphone t. iphone t flag is used to tag an image, meaning to give a name and version to our image. Let me name this image as todo iphone api and version is 1.0.0. Next, we should give the location of the Docker file, that is current directory. Let's hit enter. If you see, the image is built with this tag. Let's verify that with Docker images. Here we go. We have to do API image with 1.0.0 version. Here we are using 18 iPhone JDK version. What if we want to give this version while building the image instead of hard coding here? In programming language, we achieve this using variables. The same thing can be done here. We can create variables and use those with ARG instruction. ARG instruction is used to create variables. ARG is the only instruction that may proceed from in the Docker file. So let's create a variable with Java version. And we can use that variable here instead of hard coding this Java version. We can access this variable using dollar flower braces and variable name. This variable can be passed during the build time with iphone 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 build iphone arc your variable name is equal to value. If you don't want to pass this variable and have a default value to this variable, you can give it here with equal to 18 iphone jdk. So while building the image, if you don't pass this variable, the default value will be used. So the arg instruction defines a variable that users can pass at build time to the builder with the docker build command. Variables can also be defined using env instruction. env creates environment variables. env instruction creates the environment variables. The main difference between arg and env is that environment variables are persisted when a container is run from the resulting image. Meaning, you can access these variables even within the container. The variables defined using arg instruction are just temporary and can be used only during building an image. If you have same variable name for arg and env, 
environment variables defined using the env instruction always override an arg instruction of the same name we can override this environment variable values with iphan e flag while running an image just the way we have seen while running the mongodb container next instead of copying this jar file to the root directory of the container we'll try to create a separate folder for our application and copy our jar file to that folder instead of throwing it in the root directory generally mkdir is used to create folders so we will create a folder called opt slash deployment but as we discussed every run should start with instruction run command is used to execute these shell scripts okay the directory is created now we'll copy the jar file to this directory well, we copied the jar file to this directory. Also, when we invoke this jar file, we should give proper directory. Cool. This should work. If you look here, we duplicated this many times. So let's move it to variable. So arg app o is equal to directory name. And here we can simply access this one. Also, we can do the same over here. So instead of using this directory here, what we can do is we can change the working directory. The working directory can be changed with work dir instruction and our app home. This is similar to changing your current directory in the terminal or command line with the cd command. The subsequent instructions after this work dir command will be relative to this working directory. If the working directory doesn't exist, it will create even if it's not used by any subsequent instructions. This instruction can be used multiple times in Dockerfile. Before actually building the image, let's add some metadata to the image like application version, etc. The metadata can be added with label version 1.0.0. Multiple labels can be added in a single Dockerfile. We can expose the port expose 8080 please note that this is different from iphone p flag that we use while running the image publishing port is used to bind your container port to the host port and that is used to access your service from your local host whereas expose port is used when other container wants to talk to this service which is in different container whereas publishing port is used when you want to access your service from the local host well we have docker file for our spring boot application let's go ahead and build the image out of this docker file and run the container this is my project directory and if you see here i have docker file in the root directory so docker build iphone t to do api 1.0.2 this is my version of the image not version of the project dot the dot indicates that the current directory so whenever we instruct the directory it will tear the entire directory and it will send it to the docker daemon let's hit enter well the image is ready now let's verify that with docker images we have 1.0.2 version let's try to run this image docker run let's publish the code 8080 80 and it in the detached mode and image name is to do iphone api 1.0.2 let's run it if you see the 8080 port is already in use this is because we are running the spring boot application with the jar file let's stop this now let's try to run the image awesome the container is created Let's see whether it started from the docker logs. Docker logs container rate. Boom, there's some error. If you see, the connection is refused. This is because in the application.properties, we are giving the local host as MongoDB host. If you watched my previous video, local host cannot be accessed within the container. Either you need to give the IP address of the MongoDB container or you need to start this service in the same network that mongodb is running and then you can give the container name as host here these are all environment variables instead of changing the application dot properties i will pass this host as environment variables this property can be set in the docker file as an environment variable 
or we can pass this environment variable with the iPhone E flag while running the image. Let's pass this one from the Docker run command. I'm passing the environment variable here instead of localhost MongoDB. And we should run in the same container that MongoDB is running. Let's hit this now. The port is already in use because of the previous container that we created. Let's try to stop this. Docker stop container ID and Docker remove container ID. Well, we'll run this image now. Docker logs container ID. Well, the application is started and it is listening on localhost 88. So we are accessing the localhost 8080 and let's run this one. If you see, we got the response. This is working the same way as we ran with jar file. Okay. Let's get into the container and see if the directories are created properly or not. Docker ps. And this is our container. So Docker exec iphone it container id and sh. So we are in the container now. So let's try to print present working directory. If you see, the opt deployment is created. You can also list the environment variables. So this is the environment variable that we have set. Also, we can see the version of Java that is installed in this container. I'm sorry, Java iPhone version. If you see the Java 18 version is installed in this container. I hope the concept of Docker file is clear to you and you can write your Docker file on your own. As a practice, try to build a Docker image for your ReactJS application. You can find a bunch of ReactJS applications on GitHub. I hope you followed along with me and the Spring Boot application is up and running in your system. We will be using the Spring Boot APIs in our next videos. If you didn't watch my previous video of this series, I highly recommend you to watch it before continuing with this video as I discussed most useful instructions to build a custom image in that video. This video explains the best practices to build an image like multi-stage builds, docker caching, and the using of docker ignore file. For demonstration, we will start building the custom image for ReactJS application with simple npm start and we will improve it to production grade quality by deploying artifacts to nginx using multi-stage builds and further enhance it to reduce the build times with docker caching and further enhance it with docker ignore file. Let me open our ReactJS application with VS Code. This is our simple to-do ReactJS application. This is using the Spring Boot APIs which we deployed in the previous video of this series. And these Spring Boot APIs are talking to the MongoDB which we deployed with the Docker. Let us see how we run this application traditionally. First we need to install the dependencies with npm install. Once the dependencies are installed, we will start the application with npm start. The application is started on the port 3000 of localhost. If you see, this is the to-do item that we created in the previous video of this series using Spring Boot APIs. We can also create the new item with the UI of this application. Let's follow best practices. If you see, the item is created here. Even if I refresh the page, the item is still here because this is persisted to MongoDB that we deployed with Docker. Now let us create docker file to build a custom image for this react.js application. For a change, we will create the docker file with a different name. Dockerfile.dev. The steps we need to follow are npm install and npm start. So as we need npm, we need the base image as node. From node, I am using the alpine version of the node because that is smaller in size. Now let's create a directory for this application. Work dir slash app. So we are creating app directory in the image. Then we will copy our source code to the image, the current directory to the working directory. Then we should run the npm install. Run npm install. Next we should run the npm start, and this should be the entry point for our service. So entry point npm start that's it our docker file is ready 
if you're not sure what are these instructions as i said please watch the previous video of this series which gives you a detailed explanation of what each instruction does in a docker file let's build the image out of this docker file using the docker build docker build iphone t to do iphone ui and let's give the version as 1.0.0 and current directory if you see the error docker file no such file or directory the error says there is no file called docker file this is because we created the docker file with a different name if we don't specify any file to docker build by default it considers docker file as we have a different name we should give that name to the docker build to give the file name all we need to do is iphone f and our file name docker file dot dev this was the name that we given for the react.js application docker file let's hit enter excuse me there was a typo docker file dot dev if you see the image is building awesome the image is ready let's verify if the image is created with docker images command here we go to do iphone ui image with 1.0.0 tag now let's run this image to run our react.js application docker run and let's publish the ports 3001 port to the 3000 port and the image name is to do iphone ui 1.0.0 and let's run it in the detached mode also the container is created let's try to access our application on 3001 port localhost 3001 here is our react.js application running in docker if you see you can see the same to do items that we have created some time back but there is a problem with this approach first thing is let's try to look at the logs if you see the message here development build is not optimized to create a production build use npm run build so the npm start command is used only for the development purposes for react.js application if you want to run it in the production we need to build the artifacts from our source code and then we need to serve it so let's do the few changes to make it production grade application all you need to do is after installing the dependencies we need to build the artifacts npm run build this will create the artifacts from our source code Next, we need to install the serve module to serve these artifacts. Run npm install global level serve module. And instead of serving it with npm stat, we need to serve it with the serve module. Serve iPhone s yes, and we are serving the build directory. That's it. Let's create the image and try to run the same. Let's use the same command that we used previously and just a change in the version. Let's run this image in one version and let's run it on the 3002 port because 3001 port is already being used by other application. Let's try to access this application on 3002 port. Localhost 3002. Oops, something is wrong. Let's check the logs. Docker logs container ID. If you see, the server package is serving on the 5000 port but we map to 3000 port so let's change this one 5000 port and let's change it to 3003 because 3002 port is already used by the previous container now let's try to access our application 3003 here we go this is our application there is another issue with this approach if you check the docker images the size of this image is 524 mb which is very huge all we need is build folder which is generated when we ran npm run build right then why so much big image if you observe npm install here this generates the node modules folder which is very huge and causing the image size to be big and we don't need that folder after we do npm run build we need node modules folder only while building the artifacts so one solution would be what if we get rid of node modules folder once the artifacts are built Let's fix that with multi stage builds. Let's write another Docker file. Docker file dot prot. We are going to fix this issue with multi stage builds as opposed to single stage build that we did so far. Here we'll have two stages. One is to build the project with 
npm run build and the second stage is to copy only the build folder to nginx deploying to nginx so here instead of serving the application with serve package let's try to deploy to nginx so let's start with the first stage which is building the artifacts so from node alpine and let's create a working directory slash app and we will copy the source code next we will do npm install and then we will build the artifacts run npm run build so now we are generating the artifacts and let's give a name to the stage so that we can refer to it in the other stages so we can give a name to the stage with as build so this is my stage name well let's try to write another stage please note that each stage starts with a from instruction every stage has its own base image here we would need nginx as the base image because we are deploying it to nginx if you want to serve your application with serve package you can use the node image in the second stage also and let's use the stable iphone alpine version always try to use the alpine versions because those are very small size images which results into smaller images next we will copy the artifacts that are generated in the first stage please note that we are just copying the artifacts not the node modules folder if you see this is the build directory that gets created when you run npm run build this is a very small folder so we will copy with copy instruction previously we used the copy instruction to copy the files from source to destination but here our source is the first stage so to specify from which stage we want to copy the files all we need to do is iphone iphone from is equal to stage name our stage name is build and we are copying the slash app slash build directory because we created the working directory as slash app here and inside that we are generating the artifacts and we should copy those files to the html folder of nginx that is slash user slash share slash nginx slash html if you are using react router then we will need to change the default nginx configuration while building the image for that we need to copy a simple file to nginx you can refer to this file in the git repository i given in the description so this is the configuration file that we need to copy to the nginx to support the react routing and finally we will start our nginx cmd nginx and let's run it with daemon off mode daemon off now let's build the image and check the size of the image we will use the same command and let's give the version as 1.0.2 and the file name as dockerfile.prod oops something is wrong we did a typo here dockerfile the image is ready now let's check the image size docker images if you see the image size is just 34 mb and previously it was 524 mb that's a huge difference this is because if you see we have multiple stages in this docker file each stage generates a temporary image and these temporary build images are discarded along with the original files and folders associated with those images meaning in our example the first stage generates a temporary image and that image will be discarded along with the node modules folder which that stage has generated. As those images are discarded, those will not be included in the final image. And also we are copying only the build folder in the final image. So with multi-stage builds, we can generate a lean and production ready images. And we can improve it more with the concept of Docker caching. Let me try to change something in the source code. So instead of to-do list, I call it as my to-do list and save it and let's build the image. If you look here, npm install is running. But why do we need to run this npm install for every docker build command that we are running? We are not changing the package.json, we just change the source code. npm install is a very costly operation, meaning it will take time to run npm install as it needs to pull all dependencies from the internet 
To optimize this, we should run npm install only when we change package.json, not every time. This can be achieved with docker caching. If we can achieve this one, we can reduce the build times to greater extent. To achieve this, let's copy package.json and package-log.json separately. package star dot json and we are copying it to the current directory. And then we will run the npm install. Then we copy the source code. But how does it make difference? Let's analyze that. For every Docker instruction we run in Docker file, a layer is created and cached for further use to keep build times to a minimum. Meaning, for all these instructions, a separate layer is created and cached so that if the same instruction appears again in the future, that layer is used instead of building that layer again. This reduces the build times. If something is changed at any layer, all the subsequent instructions will be executed again, else it will use the cache. Example, if something is changed in the package.json, all these instructions will be executed again. Now, Docker knows when this file is changed and npm install gets executed only when this file is changed. If the file is changed, all the subsequent instructions get executed until the last instruction. If it's not changed, the cache generated with the previous build will be used. As we changed only the source code which we are copying here, all the instructions after this command will be executed again, not the previous ones. So with docker caching, all the layers generated from each instruction will be cached and will be used in the future builds. Now let's try to build the image and see how it goes. If you look at here, npm install didn't execute it again. You can see that this is using the cached version. But npm run build is executed again because something is changed at this point. Now let's try to build the image without changing anything, not even source code. Now even npm run build also didn't execute and the cached version is being used because nothing is changed at this instruction. So this is the beauty of docker caching. This is the last problem I can see before running this image. When we are building the image with docker build at the end we are giving this dot. Here we are instructing docker cli that zip the contents of the current directory and send it to the docker daemon for processing. We call this directory as build context. But why should I send the entire directory? For example, here we have node modules folder, which we don't need to send it to the Docker daemon for processing because we will be generating that folder anyway with npm install. Also, we don't need to send this build directory because we will be generating that one with the npm run build. And this node modules is very huge and it will cause the delays to transfer that big directory to the Docker daemon. As the daemon is in a local, you might not experience so much delay. But sometimes the daemon can be in the remote and you are trying to access the daemon from your local. In that case, the delays will be super high. So the obvious solution for this problem is sending the content only which is needed. Here probably we need this source folder and this public folder and few other files. But definitely not this node modules and build folder. If you used git, you might have seen a file called .gitignore. There we mention the patterns which should be ignored by git. In the same way, we can have a file called .docker-ignore and we can mention what files or folders should be ignored to send it to the docker daemon. Careful with the file name, it has to be .docker-ignore. Before sending the build context to the docker daemon, it checks if the file exists with .docker-ignore name. If it exists, it will ignore the folders or files matching the patterns included in that file. Here let's include node modules folder and build folder. We don't need to transfer these two folders to the docker daemon. And finally let's run the image. And let's try to run this image. So the nginx runs by default on port 80 and let's map it to the 3004 port of the host. Let's try to access 3004 port from the browser localhost 3004 here we go now we optimize the image size with multi-stage builds and improve the build times with caching and dot docker ignore file as a practice try to build a multi-stage image for the spring boot application that we deployed in the previous video 
there the first stage would be packaging with maven and in the second stage starting your jar file i hope you followed along with me and got a fair understanding of how to build a custom image for different applications with best practices containers are ephemeral meaning when a container is created from an image it can be destroyed and new containers can be built from the same docker image and put in place with a minimum of configuration and when a container is deleted any data written to that container will be lost but what if you want to persist the data of a container like our mongodb to do items that can be achieved with docker volumes let's try to understand how docker volume solves the problem of persisting container data with hands on as we discussed when you build an image from docker file for every instruction in docker file a new layer is created all these layers are read only meaning we cannot write any data to these layers and when you execute docker run for this image a new container is created with a new writable layer any data that is created within the container is written to this writable layer for example when you run the mongodb in the container any data that you want to store in our case to do items are stored in this writable layer but there are a couple of problems here it's difficult to use this container data by another process as the container is fully isolated and when you delete the container this writable layer is also deleted and the data associated with this container is also deleted so our data is lost there is no way to get the data back let's see that in action we have our mongodb container up and running that we created in the docker networking video of this series and these are the to do items that we stored in this database let's try to delete this mongodb container and create it again to delete the container first we need to stop the containers docker stop mongodb and we will do docker rm mongodb now the container is deleted let's try to create the mongodb container again this was the command that we used to create the mongodb container let's hit enter awesome the mongodb container is now up and running let's see if the data that we created previously is there or not if you see the to do database does not exist here so when you delete a container the data associated with that container is also lost this issue can be fixed with docker volumes let's say on our host we have three containers running for example one is mongo container second is postgres container and the third one is mysql container and we have our local file system where we can create our directories with docker volumes we specify that mount local directory to container data directory so whenever you write any data to the container it also gets written to the host and vice versa with this approach even when you delete the containers the data on the host will not be deleted when you create the containers again as you mount the same directory onto the container entire data is written to the container on startup and you will have your data ready in your container you can compare it to backup and restore for simplicity enough of theory let's do some hands on now we can create the docker volume with docker volume create and volume name let's give the mongo data as the volume name as we are storing the mongo data to this volume we can list out the volumes with docker volume ls if you see the volume that we created just now is here we can also filter the docker volumes with hyphen f let's give the name as filter criteria mongo data if you see we got only mongo data we can also see to which directory this volume stores the data docker inspect volume mongo data if you see this volume writes the data to this directory don't worry we will get into this directory and how the mongodb data is stored this type of volumes are called named volumes as we are giving name to the volume when you don't give any name to the volume while creating docker automatically assigns some random unique name to the volume docker volume create here i am not giving any name just hit enter if you see with a unique random name the volume is created we can verify that with 
docker volume ls here is the volume that we just created as we are not giving any name to these volumes this type of volumes are called anonymous volumes awesome we created our volume volumes can be shared meaning we can use this volume for any container we would want to also we can mount multiple volumes in a single container it's like mapping your container folder to the folder of your host in simple terms now let us create the mongodb container again with this volume before that let's stop and delete the mongodb container docker stop mongodb let's remove it with the docker rm mongodb now let's create the mongodb before that we should specify which volume to use the volume can be specified with hyphen v flag volume name is mongo hyphen data colon here we should specify which directory of the container should be stored in this volume mongodb stores the data in slash data slash db directory with this we are specifying that the data which is there in the slash data slash db directory of the container should be stored in the mongo iphone data volume if you are using postgres database the data is stored in the slash var slash lib slash postgres sql slash data and if you are using mysql the data is stored in slash var slash lib slash mysql directories volumes are not only meant for databases volumes can be used for any stateful applications let's hit enter now the mongodb container is created now let's create some data with the spring boot apis that we deployed using docker this will save the data to the mongo database that we just created let's create a to do item make sure to use volumes for any stateful application now let's stop and delete the container docker stop mongodb docker rm mongodb well our mongodb container is now deleted now let's create the mongodb container with the previous command that we used please note that here we are using volume now let's hit enter now the expectation is that as we used volumes whatever the data that we created previously should not be deleted let's verify that by refreshing this mongo express page if you see the to do database is still here and the document that we created is still here so with the help of docker volumes we can persist the container data even if the container gets deleted let's try to see where and how the volume data is stored in the docker host if we inspect the container docker inspect mongo db we can see the mount section here as you see the data is stored in this directory let's get into this directory on linux we can find this directory but on mac or windows if you try to get into this directory you will see an error this is because when you install docker desktop a small vm is created and all the data related to docker like images containers and volumes are stored in this vm so to see this data we should get into this vm to get into the vm we should execute this command if you see the cursor we are in the docker vm now let's get into this docker directory cd and let's list the directories if you see the containers networks volumes and the images are stored here you can find all the data related to the docker in this directory now let's try to get into the volumes directory list down this is our volume let's get into this directory for every volume a new directory is created in this volumes directory and in the volume directory there's a folder called underscore data now let's try to list down the files in this directory if you see all the mongodb collection information is here let's come out of this docker vm exit awesome when you run the container if you don't give any volume here an anonymous volume is created and used instead of giving volume we can give the path of our local host so here instead of storing the container data in the vm we are storing it in the directory of our system this concept is called bind mounts to persist the containers data we can use the volumes 
or we can use the any directory of our system directly. Volumes are stored as part of the host file system which is managed by Docker and volumes are the best way to persist the data in Docker. Volumes can be managed by the Docker CLI just like we created Docker create command. Whereas if you use bind mounts, the data can be stored anywhere on the system and these directories are not managed by Docker CLI. These are like any other directories on your system. You can try this bind mounts on your system and see if the data is getting stored in this directory instead of in your volume. We can delete our volume with docker volume rm and our volume name. If you see the error, volume is in use. Just like you cannot delete a container that is running, you cannot delete the volume which is used by any container. So to delete this volume, we should delete the MongoDB container because that container is using this volume. Docker stop MongoDB. Docker RM MongoDB. Now the container is deleted. Now let's try to delete the volume. The volume is deleted. We can verify with Docker volume ls. Please note that whenever you delete the container, the volume is not removed. You should delete the volume manually. Now, whatever the data is stored in the MongoDB is lost because we deleted the volume. So, be careful when you delete your volume. As a practice, you can run the Jenkins with Docker using volumes and see if the jobs that you created in Jenkins persist between the runs. I hope you followed along with me and got a fair understanding of how to persist the data of a container. We have the custom image that we built with us in our system. What if you want to use that image across different environments, like if you want to move it to QA, staging and production environments. We should store that image somewhere so that we can pull that image in different environments. That place where we store our images is called registry. So once we build the image, we push it to the Docker registry. Then that image can be pulled into any environment. In fact, we can share it with the public. Let's see how we can push the Spring Boot image that we built to the registry and use it in a different environment. Well, this is our Spring Boot image that we built. Let's try to push this image to Docker registry. There are different registry options available like Docker Hub. This is the public repository where we can push our images and everyone can access them. Just like we used our Mongo image. If you remember, we pulled it from Docker Hub. Also, we have cloud services like Amazon ECR and Azure Container Registry, etc. In fact, we can host our own registry. For this, Docker provides an image called registry. I will give you the link in the description on how to set up your own registry. Feel free to comment if I need to make a video on this. I'll be happy to do that. For this course, let's see how we can push images to AWS ECR and how we can pull those images on a different mission as AWS is widely used cloud provider in the market. But more or less, the same steps apply for any registry with few modifications. Let's try to log into AWS console. For that, just Google AWS console and go to AWS management console. I am assuming that you have basic knowledge of AWS services. If not, don't worry. I will try to explain the things as we move. By the way, I am planning to make a video series on AWS services. If you are interested, please let me know in the comment section. Let's try to log into AWS console. So this is my email ID. Enter the CAPTCHA. Enter your password. If you don't have AWS account, you can create one. Now click on the services and search for ECR. You can see the elastic container registry here as i didn't push any images to this account i don't see anything here let's try to create a repository in aws we should create a separate repository for every image we can push multiple versions of our image to this repository let's click get started here we should give the repository name as our application is to do iphone api let's give the same name as the repository name you can give any name that you would like to and let's make it as a private registry if it is a private repository one should authenticate before pulling the images when you select the public repository anyone can pull your images 
let's go and click on create repository our repository is created and this is our repository URI every repository as an URI and the format of the URI is account number dot dkr dot ecr dot now we are in the US East one region dot amazon aws dot com slash your repository name so let's try to push our image to this repository to see what are the commands needed to push an image to this repository just select your repository and click on this view push commands these are the commands that we should run to push an image to the ECR. We cannot push the images from the AWS console. We should push our images from the terminal or command line. As a first step, we should retrieve an authentication token and authenticate our Docker client to this registry. For that, we will be using AWS CLI. Let's copy this command by clicking on this icon. Now open your terminal. Just like we logged into management console before using our AWS services, we should log into the AWS from the terminal as well. For that, we will be using AWS access keys. If you don't have AWS CLI installed, I will give the link in the description to install AWS CLI on your system. Also, I will provide a link on how to get your access keys and log into AWS using AWS CLI. So on my system, I logged into AWS from the terminal. So now I'll be pasting the command that we copied. So this will authenticate our Docker client with the AWS ECR registry. Let's hit enter. Awesome. Login is successful. So now we authenticated our Docker client with AWS ECR. Let's try to list the repositories that we have. AWS ECR describe iPhone repositories. If you see, this is the repository that we just created. Now let us see what is the next command that we should use to push our image. Next we should build the image. We don't need to run this command as our image is already ready with us. And we also use the same docker build command to build our image. So once the image is ready, we should tag our image so that we can push that to this repository. So let's copy this command. Clear the screen and paste it here. So our image is to do iPhone API. 1.0.2 so basically we are renaming our image here let's hit enter let's try to list the images now docker images if you see a new image is created with a different name basically this copies the same image with the different name if you see the size is same 496 mb so once we renamed our image we should push our image to the registry with this command let's paste it here and our image name is 1.0.2 now let's hit enter. If you see the different layers are being pushed to the AWS ECR. Awesome. Our image is now pushed to the AWS ECR repository. Let's verify it in the management console. Let's close this and get into this repository. If you see 1.0.2 version is here. You can push different versions of your image to this repository. Now let's change some code and build a different version of the image and let's try to push that version to the AWS ECR. I'm just changing the size to be 512 here and just saving it and go to terminal and build docker build iPhone T to do iPhone API 1.0.3. So here we are building a different version of our Spring Boot image space dot enter. Okay, the new version of our image is ready. Let's verify that. Docker images. Here we go. So now let's try to rename this image to include the AWS ECR domain. I will tell you in a while why we actually need to rename this image. So if you want to find out the command for that, let's go to ECR, view push commands. And this was the command that we used. So now we should change the latest to 1.0.3. 1.0.3 let's hit enter now we rename the image let's verify that here we go now let's try to push the image to ECR 1.0.3 awesome we push the image let's verify that by refreshing this list if you see 1.0.3 version is here in this way we can push multiple versions of our image to this repository in AWS, you should create a separate repository for each image. In other Docker registries, you can push different images to single repository. But with AWS, separate repository for each image. Well, we pushed our image to the registry. 
Now it's time for us to pull this image in a different environment. For that, as a test environment, I launched an EC2 instance. If you don't know what is EC2 instance, you can assume it as a different computer. So you can log into that computer with SSH. So if you see now I am on a different computer which is using Ubuntu as OS. In this instance, I installed a Docker AWS CLI. Also, I logged into AWS. If you list down the images here, I'm sorry, if you list down the images here, it is not having permission. So, so we should add sudo docker images. If you see, there are no images here. Please note that this is not my local computer. This is AWS EC2 instance, which is a different computer altogether. So you can assume this as your QA environment. So now we pushed our image from our dev environment to registry and we are pulling the same image in the QA environment from that registry. To pull the image, just like we used to pull from the Docker Hub, docker pull to do iPhone API colon 1.0.3 but wait a second how would docker know that it has to pull from your aws ecr account as we have seen every aws account will have a unique account number so we should mention from which repository we are trying to pull our image so here we should give the registry domain if we don't give any registry name docker automatically considers it as docker.io slash library so this is the reason whenever we do docker pull image name, it was pulling from the docker hub. So now in order to pull from our AWS ECR, we should give the AWS ECR domain name here. So this was the exact reason why we were renaming our images before pushing it to registry. So let's delete this and give our AWS ECR domain name. So now it will pull this image from the AWS ECR domain that we given with this specific version or tag. Let's hit enter. If you see the image is being pulled. As you see, we downloaded the newer image. Let's verify that with sudo docker images. Here we go. So we have our to do API image with 1.0.3 tag of 496 MB. So this is how you can share your images across different environments. In fact, you can share your images with the public if you push those images into the public repository. AWS ECR charges a little amount for the storage of your images. So let's try to delete this repository for the sake of cleanup. So you can delete this repository by typing delete and clicking on this delete button. So our repository is now deleted. So this is how you can push your images to private repository. As a practice, you can push the React.js image that we built to the AWS ECR registry or any other registry. If you face any issues, please let me know in the comment section and I will answer your questions. So far, we have three components. UI built with React, API developed with Spring Boot and database with MongoDB. Also, we have Mongo Express. All these services are running in Docker and talking to each other. If at all we have to spin up all these services in other system, we should run multiple commands which we ran throughout this series. Like building images, creating containers, publishing ports, passing environment variables, creating networks, creating volumes, etc. This is tedious, time consuming and error prone. What if there's a way to automate all these steps? That's where Docker Compose comes into the picture. With Docker Compose, we can kind of automate this process and track the changes that we do. Let us see how we can deploy our full stack application with just a single command using Docker Compose. So far, we have done the following. We have deployed MongoDB and Mongo Express. After that, we created a network and established communication between these containers using the container name. Later, we built a custom image for Spring Boot. After that, we built an image for the React.js application by following best practices like Docker caching, multi-stage builds, etc. And also, we have seen how to persist the data by using volumes even after the container is deleted. Later, we pushed and pulled our Spring Boot image 
to and from Docker registry like AWS ECR. We have done all this using different commands. Now let us see how we can spin up all these services with just a single command. You heard it correct, with just a single command. For that, we should translate all these commands into a Docker Compose file, which is a one-time job. Let's do that for each service and learn the various concepts of Docker Compose. Let us start by creating the Docker Compose file. New file docker compose.yaml. We can give any name we would like to. We will write this file in YAML. We are going to translate all these commands into Docker Compose file. Initially, we should specify the version of the docker compose with version. The latest version is 3. Now we should specify the services. Let's start with MongoDB. First, let us give the name of the service which is MongoDB. Now we should define how this service should run. This is going to use Mongo image. So image as Mongo which is equivalent to specifying image with the docker run command here and we will publish the ports note that this is an array we can publish multiple ports this is how we write an array in ml with iphon the ports are going to be so 27017 port of the host to the 27017 port of the container this is equivalent to publishing ports with iphon p flag in the docker run command now we should pass the environment variables with environment. Again, this is also an array. So we will be giving the array elements with iPhon. And this is equivalent to passing environment variables with iPhon E flag in the Docker run command. So the first environment variable will be username of the MongoDB. And the second one will be password of the MongoDB and that's it now we should give a network which we specified with iphone iphone net in the docker run command there's one interesting thing here by default docker compose creates a default bridge network for all the services that we define in docker compose and adds those services to this default network so technically there is no need to create the network if at all we want to create a custom network just like we created with docker network create we can do that in docker compose with networks and we can start giving the networks here so our network name was mongo iphone net by default docker compose prefixes this network with the current folder name meaning now it will create to do iphone ui underscore mongo iphone net as we are in the to do iphone ua folder so to override this name we can give the name for this network with name mongo net note that this is the network identifier and this is the name with which the network will be created now we should mention that mongodb should use this network with networks in the mongodb service networks again this is also an array as we discussed, we can assign a service to multiple networks. So our service is mongo iphone net. Finally, we should give the volume to this mongo db. If you remember, we created the volume with docker volume create. So let's create the volume in the docker compose file with volumes. This is similar to how we created the network using networks. Now we are going to give the volume name which is mongo data same goes here we should specify the name of the volume mongo data now we should specify our mongodb to use this volume with volumes and this is also an array again as we discussed we can give multiple volumes to the single container mongo data this is similar to giving our volume with iphone v flag just like docker compose generates a name with the prefix of the current folder for the networks and volumes in the same way the container is created with the prefix of the current folder to override that name we should give container name and this should be mongodb this is just to override the container name with the specified value 
if we don't give it docker compose prefixes this name with the to do iphone ui which is the current folder that we are in i hope we covered all sections of this docker run commands that we given here let's do the same thing for the mongo express starting with service name which is mongo iphone web and this is going to use an image of mongo iphone express and the environment variables that we passed were username and password also the container name of the mongo db note that the name can be the container name or the service name both will work and we should create this one in the mongo net network mongo iphone net and this is not going to use any volume because this is not a database this is just a client to connect to the database and let's override the container name with container name and mongo iphone web now as this mongo express uses mongo db it is wise to create this mongo express only once mongo db is created we can do that in docker compose with depends on depends on mongo db here we are just specifying that create this container only once the mongo db container is created which makes sense because this container depends on the mongo db container now i want you to pause the video and do the same for spring boot and react.js applications i hope you tried it now let's do the same thing for the spring boot so this was the command that we used to run the spring boot image let's give the service name as to do iphone api and this is going to use the image of to do iphone api 1.0.2 for a change as we push this image to aws ecr let's pull it from the aws ecr to demonstrate how we can pull the images from private repositories so this was the image that we pushed to aws ecr so now this is going to pull image from aws ecr instead of docker hub as we are giving the domain here note that when you run this docker compose file you must be logged into aws ecr with aws cli now we should publish the ports here which is 8080 by the way we forgot to publish the ports of the mongo express which is ports 8081 to 8081 now we should pass environment variables with environment the indentation is very important in the yaml so the environment variable will be the host of the mongodb and we should run this one in the mongonet network which is mongo iphone net this is very simple just we are converting the docker run commands into docker compose file that's it we are not doing anything extra just we are putting in the aml format which is easy to maintain and track the changes that we are going to make and the container name would be to do iphone api and this depends on mongodb mongodb because this spring boot apis will insert the data into the mongodb now let's do the same thing for react.js application this was the command that we used to run the react.js application so the name of the service would be to do iphone ui and this is going to use image of to do iphone ui 1.0.2 wait a second here if you are going to run this docker compose file from where this image gets pulled by default it will try to pull the image from docker hub but this is our custom image this doesn't exist in docker hub so it will definitely fail we will see how we can build the image with the docker compose itself so we will be assuming that we will have this source code in the other system so now we should translate this command to docker compose this command is basically building the ui image from the custom docker file so let's do that with docker compose we can do this with build and if you remember the context is the current directory and the docker file which we will be using is dockerfile.prod and the image name is to do iphone ui 1.0.2 so we covered all the parts of docker build command in this docker compose file and everything else will be same like publishing the ports would be 3000 to 3000 i think it's 3000 to 80 because we are running in the nginx and this is dependent on two things one is 
API to do iPhone API and the other one is MongoDB. I hope we covered all the parts of Docker run command of the React.js application. Cool. We are done with the Docker Compose file. Let's delete the things that we don't need and let's make it a little cleaner. Awesome. Now we will see that magic single command to spin up all these services at once. All we need is just head back to your terminal and type docker iphone compose up. Docker compose comes with the docker package. So we don't need to install any separate package. By default docker compose reads docker iphone compose yaml file in the present working directory. If you want to pass custom file name to docker compose just like we passed docker file to docker build command we can do that with iphone f. So docker compose dot yaml. If you see there are a couple of errors. So before running your services docker compose actually validates the format that we specified in the docker compose. If you see it is saying that depends on contents and invalid type it should be an array or object. Same goes with Mongo web. Let's see what the mistake that we did. Here we are not giving this as an array. So let's give that as an array and the spelling mistake it is MongoDB. Also same goes with a to do API which is an array. Also we forgot to map the volume to the container directory which is slash data slash db which is similar to mentioning it here. If you don't know what it is, please refer to my docker volumes video of this series. Now let us try to run the command again. Before that, let's make sure that there are no active containers running. If you see, there are no containers running. I deleted all the containers to demonstrate that we can spin up those with docker compose. Also, we don't have network. Sorry, docker network ls. If you see, I deleted the network also. Same goes with volume, volume. I deleted the volume as well. Now let us see if Docker Compose will create all these services or not. Now let's run the same command, which is Docker Compose up. Let's hit enter. This will run all the services. Let's see the output of this command. If you see, it created the network. Also, it created the default network and it created the volume. Also, it created MongoDB, MongoWeb to do iPhone API to do iPhone UI and if you observe here the container name of the react.js application is little different. My assumption is that we forgot to mention the container name of the UI application. Let's verify that. Exactly. We didn't give the container name for the react.js application. As we discussed if we don't override the name automatically it prefixes with the current working directory with the service name and with some suffix. But other than that, everything looks good. And also, this is we are running in the attached mode. Let's run it in the detached mode. Control C to come out and iPhone D. So if you see now we are in the detached mode. Let's verify that with Docker ES iPhone A. As you can see, all are in the running state. Let's try to access our Mongo Express. Let's go back to the browser and access it with localhost 8081. Here we go. The Mongo Express is up. Also, we can access our React.js application with localhost 3000. This is our React.js application. You cannot see the to-do items because I deleted the volume and we created it again. Now let's try to add some item. Go through Docker Compose documentation. Now we created a to-do item. So we can make sure that our API is working by refreshing this page. The item is still here, meaning the item is inserted into the MongoDB. We can verify that with Mongo Express. Just refresh the page. To-do database is created. There's a to-do's collection and in that the document is here. It's that simple with Docker Compose. Everything is just with single command. Now, if you want to stop the service, all you need to do is same thing. Instead of up, you need to do stop. And if you want to stop all the services, just hit enter. But if you want to stop a specific service, all you need to do is just pass the your service name. Let's try to stop Mongo web. So this will stop the Mongo Express. The error is because it is assuming the iPhone D also as a service. Let's delete that and hit enter. If you see the service is stopped, we cannot access the Mongo Express now. Let's verify that. As you can see, this is down. If you want to bring it back, all you need to do is instead of stop, just hit 
start enter it is up you can verify that by refreshing this page this is up and one more interesting thing is if we change anything in the docker compose file only that service will be recreated the other services will not get modified to demonstrate that let's try to change the name of the to do iphone ui let's go here and give the container name here container name as to do iphone ui we changed only react.js application now let's try to hit the up command if you see all these are up to date so no changes are done but it recreated the ui so to verify that docker ps iphone 8 as you can see the react.js application name is updated and if you want to bring all the services down and also you want to delete the containers all you need to do is instead of up just hit down the difference between stop and down is stop will only stop the services whereas down will stop and remove the containers as well all are deleted let's verify that with docker ps iphone 8 all the containers are deleted please note that it will delete the network as well as you can see the network is also deleted you can see here removing network the reason why it created a default network initially was because we didn't assign any network to the to do iphone ui that's the reason it created a default network and assigned that service to react.js application please note that this is not the name of the service this is just a prefix which is current working directory as we discussed if you don't assign services to any network automatically it will create a default network and it will assign those services to that network and also note that it will not delete the volume if it deletes the volume there is no meaning for the volumes because the only purpose of the volume is to persist the data even after the container is deleted now let's clear this and let's try to bring our services up with up command iphone d if you see everything is again getting created we can verify that with docker ps iphone a everything created again also you can check the logs with docker iphone compose logs as you can see the spring boot application is started here i hope you got a fair understanding of what is docker compose and how to use it congratulations I hope you have learned everything you need about Docker and you're all set to start working on it. I'm super excited to see you in my other courses. My name is Pawan Iltapu and I thank you very much for watching this video. If you liked it, please share it with your friends and do not forget to subscribe to my channel to not miss any updates.